From the world of politics. I'm confident both bills will reach the president's desk. To the world of business. The reality is that the companies get to make the rules. This is Balance of Power with David Weston. From Bloomberg's World Headquarters in New York on this eventful day, I'm Lisa Abramowitz in for David Weston. And from Bloomberg's Washington Bureau to our TV and radio audiences worldwide, I'm Joe Matthew. Welcome to Balance of Power. President Biden today is set to announce a new mandate for federal workers to be vaccinated. We go straight to the White House now. Bloomberg Washington correspondent Anne-Marie Hordern is there. Anne-Marie, who would this actually apply to and how would it work? Hi, Joe. Well, it'll apply to all federal workers, so millions of individuals. And it's either you go and get inoculated and take up the vaccine, or there's going to be other requirements for you, like testing every day, potentially more social distancing. Already in the White House, we do see them following the new CDC guidelines, which is if you're a staffer, wear a mask. And if you're not outside on camera and you're inside the press room, you also need to mask up. Um, but today, this will be a big step in terms of mandating vaccines. And if you're not getting vaccinated, then you at least have to require uh, frequent testing. Um, this is what the president is expected to announce. And Marie, we've heard a lot of pushback, a lot of protests, Republican senators in particular saying this is not the way to go about it. They are losing credibility. How is the White House responding to that criticism? The White House constantly says that they are just following the science, so they are looking to the CDC. And right now what they are saying is that because we have the surge in the Delta variant, this is what really pushed them to make the move on the vaccine mandates. Um, I would say the Republican Party is also split. A lot of people are in the Republican, especially senators, are saying, at what, at some of them are saying, we don't want to see mandates, whether it's masks or vaccines. But a lot of Republicans are also making a push forward, like Senator Mitch McConnell, who always points to the fact as well that he had polio and points to the polio vaccine. Uh, just, just yesterday, speaking on uh, Fox Business with Larry Kudlow, he said he couldn't imagine a time in American history where there would be a vaccine available, and you just can't imagine Americans not wanting to take it up. So you're seeing a little bit of a mix of rhetoric from Republicans, uh, but this administration constantly, Lisa, is pointing to the science. And Marie, there are a lot of concerns about removing a sweetener, if you will, or a reward for being vaccinated, and that's taking your mask off. You already made the point. Masks are back on on campus at the White House. This would apply to contractors as well, right? Businesses that are doing work there. It's very interesting regarding the mask because um, many people are questioning why now. We had data from overseas that hospitalizations were up due to the Delta variant, that uh, potentially it, it spreads much quicker, potentially also uh, you were able to contract it and death rates were up. Why now did the CDC first say if you're vaccinated, you could take off your mask and now say you're not? And it is a good point that the incentive to getting vaccinated um, for many was I don't want to walk around with a mask and I want to be able to have more freedoms in my life. And now even if you have a, a vaccination you still need to wear a mask here at the white house and also we should say at the hill as well and dc in terms of the cdc has also moved to orange which means joe if you and i go into a local shop we should also be wearing a mask all right and marie hardern with your mask update correspondent of course for washington dc in the daytime and evening time because it's not stopped there thank you so much for being with us in the meantime also in washington dc the federal reserve released their uh, results yesterday and they did not make any change to the rate decision but they did put an emphasis on the jobs rate and indicated that they still had a ways to go. Economic data that came out this morning seemed to edify that. Simona Makuda was watching that as well, along with a lot of analysts across Wall Street. She is State Street Global Advisors, senior economist. Uh, Simona, can you give us a sense of what you looked for in the data that we got, the GDP figures that disappointed, the jobless figures that disappointed to the wrong way, upside surprise, you don't want that. What was your read on that? On the GDP number, I would say it was in many ways a very strong report. If you looked at the final demand numbers, if you looked at the consumer spending part of it, but it did disappoint consensus. It was pretty much in line with our view because we did expect a big hit from inventories and certainly we got that. And we did expect the continuing drag from foreign trade. Um, so both of those things, I think, will remain drags to performance in the near future. And what worries me a little bit, though, not perhaps worries is a bit strong of a word, but 
I'm wondering what is the spending mentality of a consumer whose savings rate is in the well in the double digit, 20%, and one a few months from now where who's looking at single digit savings rate and with income perhaps slowing as well. So I do expect consumer spending to moderate in the second half of the year. I do expect continued drag from inventories. And so we remain below consensus on U.S. growth this year. Simona, is it possible to factor in the impact of COVID as a potential drag on the economic rebound, our reopening, when you look across the next couple of months, do you anticipate a slowdown in spending like we saw during the initial surges from this virus? Um, if we see a moderation in spending, I would not really link it to COVID and the Delta variant. I would link it to um, you know, the dissipation of uh, fiscal uh, transfers, um, the end of the supplemental um, unemployment benefits, um, erosion of that reopening effect. Consumers have been out spending for some time now, so that you know, big pent up demand that um, has helped us over the last couple of quarters will still be helpful, but not to the same extent. So I do expect the slowdown to occur, but not necessarily because of. COVID itself. Yeah, you were talking a lot in your notes about uh, just the issues of supply chain disruptions, of the uh, amount of time that it's going to take to rebuild inventories. We've heard a lot about labor shortages. These are some of the areas that did seem to crimp some of the growth that we could have otherwise seen. Also, high prices, which diminished certain purchasing power and it seemed to uh, push people away from particularly home-related purchases. How much do you see that persisting beyond perhaps what even the Federal Reserve is looking at? It's really hard to tell, but I, I think we are all coming to an agreement that this is not a matter of months, but a matter of a few quarters. We could well be into 2022 before these things are resolved. Um, you've heard from companies saying that in some cases it may take more than a year, or even two, to really resolve the acute shortages in the global supply chain. So I think these issues will be with us for a while. It's partly why we've been, you know, a little more cautious on near-term growth, but quite optimistic on 2022, as some of these issues will get resolved gradually. Simona, Lisa mentioned a worker shortage. We've been talking about infrastructure here in Washington for weeks and weeks. It looks like something might happen with thousands of projects that could get underway relatively quickly. Will there be a workforce to do those jobs? Um, we'll eventually find it. Uh, everything comes at a price, um, that's the mechanism through which the market uh, finds equilibrium. So it could be that in order to attract the workers we need, wages need to go up. We've already starting to see that. I think that's perhaps the most critical question in the whole inflation debate and its transient nature. Are we going to see something shifting on, on the wage formation process that leads us to you know, a perhaps a more stronger inflation backdrop that's sustained beyond the near term and beyond the supply chain challenges. So yes, finding the workers will be a challenge. We know it already is. Well, it's just to build on this idea, the infrastructure talks have really stemmed from also this inflation debate with both sides of the aisle taking opposing views on inflation and how concerning that is, how much fiscal spending will add to that. What's your view on that? I mean, do you think that some of these projects could add to the inflationary impulse or is it unrelated at this point? I would say that it's possible they will add to inflationary pressures in the near term, but I will say if I were to have a source of inflation, I'd rather have infrastructure spending as being that source because I know this kind of spending down the line actually increases our productive capacity and helps our economy grow faster while keeping inflation in check. So it's a temporary impulse I think other um, you know, forces have had much larger a role to play in, in causing today's inflation numbers. Um, there is a lot of money in the economy, but I do believe that we, if we are gonna spend more, let's spend it on infrastructure. Thanks to Simone Makuda, Senior Economist with State Street Global Advisors.
Thanks yeah. for your time today on Balance of Power. It's fascinating to see this, Joe. I mean, honestly, looking at the debate, it seems to be heating up and becoming increasingly bifurcated with Democrats and Republicans with respect to inflation. Republicans really saying, look, people are spending more in the grocery store and Democrats yep. saying that doesn't mean we should spend less. Well, that's right. In fact, saying we should spend more because that means growth. We spoke recently with Mark Zandi, the economist at Moody's. He said that could add a tenth of a percentage point to GDP uh, going out through many quarters, which in itself will help families in this rebound. The question is, will they keep paying more, Lisa? Yeah. And the other issue is just, you know, who has it right? Because people have gotten inflation wrong for so long. Well, coming up, the infrastructure plan still faces strong headwinds on Capitol Hill. Next, we'll talk with Republican Senator Rick Scott of Florida about why he voted no last night. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg TV and Radio. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg TV and Radio. I'm Lisa Abramowitz in New York. And I'm Joe Matthew in Washington. For Bloomberg First Word News, we now go to Mark Crumpton in New York. Joe, thank you. The U.S. economy grew slower than expected in the second quarter. Gross domestic product expanded at a 6.5% annualized rate. That's well off the 8.4% estimate. The effects of supply chain restraints reverberated through the economy. And it took the shine off one of the biggest uh, gains in consumer spending in decades. It's a major push forward for President Biden's ambitious economic agenda. The Senate voted to begin work on that $950 billion infrastructure bill. And Democrats uh, united behind a plan to push through a broader budget resolution. Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer says he hopes to get both through his chamber before the upcoming August recess. A surprise from a Bloomberg analysis of vaccinations in the United States. Some of the most vaccine-resistant parts of the country are now leading the way in the number of people getting a first dose. The increase in vaccinations is concentrated in the southern and central parts of the United States. In Tokyo at the Olympic Games, American gymnast Sunisa Lee has won the women's individual all-around title. Her victory came a day after a teammate, defending champion Simone Biles, withdrew from the competition. Lee is 18 years old. It's the fifth straight gold medal for the U.S. in the women's individual all around. Global News 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in over 120 countries. I'm Mark Crumpton. This is Bloomberg. Joe, back to you in Washington. All right, thank you. The bipartisan infrastructure deal announced yesterday is moving forward. As you just heard, the Senate voting last night to advance the measure following weeks and weeks of negotiations. Senator Rick Scott of Florida is one of the Republicans who voted against moving that measure forward last night. He joins us now from Capitol Hill. Senator Scott, welcome to Bloomberg. It's nice to see you today. I wonder what it was that your Republican colleagues agreed to in this framework that you objected to. Well, number one, I like infrastructure. I like roads, bridges, airports, and seaports. In my eight years as governor, I spent $85 billion on them, but also cut taxes and fees 100 times and paid off a third of state debt. Here's my concern about this. One, we've never seen the text. We don't know exactly what's in the bill. We don't know how it's going to be paid for. It's $1.2 uh, trillion, $1.2 trillion. The Chuck Schumer was clear today. This is just a precursor to his $5.5 trillion dollar reckless tax and spending program so you're going to see a lot of tax increases as a result of doing this so i think let's let's understand what's in the bill first before we even start how can you even start talking about it when you don't even know what's in the bill so you are open-minded though once there is a document do you plan to to read it wait for a score and vote on it at that point senator yeah what i like i want to read it i want to get a score I'm not going to. I'm not going to raise your taxes. I, I, have a, I oppose tax increases. We, our governments are big enough. We shouldn't be raising people's taxes, uh, and and I'm not going to raise the debt. We we have almost 30 trillion dollars for the debt. We, um, you know, we're in two days. We're going to, uh, you know, pass our our debt ceiling limit again. 
Uh, so I'm, I'm not going to raise, I don't want to raise the debt. I don't want to raise your taxes. We got to live within our means like you do, like every family does. And this reckless spending is causing inflation. I'm hearing it for families all across my state. People are saying gas prices are up 50% in a year. Food prices are way up. Uh, so they're, they're struggling to feed their families yeah. and uh, have enough gas to get to work to make a make a living. Senator Scott, I'd love to have an hour to talk about inflation with you. I'm sure a lot of people uh, would love to have that debate. Let's shift gears to the other main topic that's dominating Washington, D.C., and that is how to deal with rising COVID cases. I know that in your own Florida, hospitalizations have broken the previous uh, record set in January. You've been a vocal opponent to mandating masks and mandating vaccines. Why? Well, first off, I got the vaccine. I've, I've, I've actually, I had COVID. Um, I've got the vaccine, and I recommend that people get the vaccine. But I believe what government should be doing, rather than mandating things, they should be giving you more information so you can make an informed decision. Who doesn't want to stay, keep themselves healthy and keep their family healthy? We all do. So give people good information. And when you, what did they just tell us? They tell you if you got, if you have had the vaccine, they still want you to wear a mask. So is that going to get more people to get the, get the to the vaccine? No, it's it's going to it's going to say, well, wait a minute, why am I getting the vaccine? So I think let's. I, I recommend people get the vaccine. I got the vaccine. I don't believe government should be mandating vaccines or well, masks. Hold on a second, because government is responsible for public health. And when it comes to public health, it's not just about freedom for the individual to decide. It's also about the freedom of society to remove itself from a pandemic. And there's a question, especially as we see surging cases in the likes of Florida, how do you bring things down if people are not getting vaccinated and if people are not wearing masks? Well, I think I think what you should be doing is is giving them good information uh, and let people make good choices. People make good choices. Families in this country want to be healthy, but they don't want to be told what to do. This is just fear mongering. And here's what's the next thing that's going to happen. We're going to have de Democrat governors and mayors around the country shut down these with these non-essential businesses. Your business is essential to you and to your employees. They're going to shut down schools again, and parents are not going to have their kids in school. We need our children in school. We need our businesses open. We don't need another government shutdown. Senator, a lot of uh, officials would say that actually bringing down the cases is the fastest way to getting people back to school and getting businesses up and running. There is a clear divide in Republican states and Democratic states with respect to vaccination rates, with it being much lower in Republican states and much higher in Democratic states. What are you personally doing to reach out to fellow Republicans citizens and saying, look, you need to get vaccinated if you want to end this pandemic. I've been clear all along. I, I support the vaccine. I, th I thank the Trump administration for Operation Warp Speed. It was great that they, what these private companies did. Uh, I've told people all along. I think people ought to go get the vaccine and I think they ought to look, learn as much as they can about COVID and keep their families safe. Senator, I see masks are required again at Disney World. You're dealing with a tourist economy in Florida that is very dependent upon the trajectory of this virus. Are you confident you're going to make it through the summer in Florida? And if not, what kind of steps are you prepared to take to protect tourist businesses in your state? Well, first off, I think any private business has the opportunity to make whatever rules they want. So if they want to require masks, I mean, that's what they should, that's what they should do. And then as a, as a potential customer, I get, a, I get to have a choice whether I want to go there or not. I think every business ought to look at and say, how do they keep their employees safe? How do they keep their, keep their customers safe and make a good informed decision? And I think every family should be doing the same thing. And again, I support people getting the vaccine. I know you served in the Navy, Senator, and it's a proud Navy state in Florida. If, as anyone knows, if they've been to Pensacola, when President Biden today announces the mandate for vaccines as expected for federal workers, he apparently will not for the military. Should he? I don't believe government should be mandating the vaccine with, for anybody. I believe they should give people good information and people make good informed decisions. I mean, I've, ta I've talked to federal workers that, that said, look, I'm, I'm taking care of myself. I don't need the government telling me how to lead my life. I don't need the, the government should be telling me I have to take a vaccine. They said, I'm doing everything I can to be healthy. I'm very comfortable. I'm, I'm going to stay healthy. I think people how should about, have that choice. Those serving in uniform, though, for instance, Senator, those who are on ships where we have seen some outbreaks, for instance, a couple of aircraft carriers had trouble uh, in the initial surge of COVID. What would you tell them? Well, I would, I would recommend to people that they get the vaccine. But I would again say, you know, if, if, you, for, you know, if you believe that you can keep yourself healthy, then that's what you, that's what you should do. I mean, I, and on top of that, I think the CDC should give us 
better information about why they're making these, these decisions so we as individuals can make better choices uh, for ourselves and our families. Senator Rick Scott, thank you so much uh, for being with us and spending the time. Senator Scott, a Republican of Florida, uh, speaking about infrastructure spending as well as, of course, the mask issue as the number of COVID cases rises on the heels of the Delta variant. From New York and Washington, D.C., this is Bloomberg. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg TV and Radio. I'm Joe Matthew in Washington. And I'm and Lisa Abramowitz. And I'm Lisa Abramowitz in New York. We have been waiting for Robin's Hood initial public offering. It's probably one of the most anticipated IPOs of the year, if not the most. And it did price yesterday below expectations. For more, let's welcome Bloomberg News Stocks Editor Dave Wilson. Dave, we are expecting this uh, at any minute. And what is the sense on the street in terms of demand? Well, I mean, when you consider that Robinhood, with its $38 a share price, was at the low end of its proposed range, I mean, it does raise the question about how much demand there will be. And the idea of allocating 35% of the shares to uh, smaller investors, those using Robinhood's uh, trading app, I mean, that's relatively unusual. I mean, you don't see that kind of allocation normally. And, you know, it'll also raise the question of how interested the retail investors who trade on Robinhood are going to be in actually owning the shares of Robinhood. Right now, I just want to bring you some breaking news. Robinhood uh, did open at $38. The IPO was at $38. People were speculating that perhaps it would come in a little bit higher. Again, the fact that it came in on the low end after being one of the most uh, anticipated in IPOs of the year is really telling and really raises some questions about demand and pr uh, previous valuations. Shanali Basak has been covering this all carefully, and she has much more insight than I do. Let's bring her in. Uh, Shanali, what's your sense of where it opened. Yeah, $38 is definitely in line with where it priced. You could say they either priced it to perfection, but we'll see where it ends the day. Remember, there are still sellers, including employees of the company, that are able to trade this stock on day one. If it ends lower, there's going to be a lot of concerns about what this means for this big debut for the retail investor, where we know 20 to 25 percent was gave, give to, given to the retail investor, particularly through Robinhood. Interestingly, when Vlad Tenet the CEO had talked to Emily Chang a little bit earlier. He hadn't really answered the question as to why it was that so little of the offering was given to retail when as much as 35% of the offering was uh, made available to retail investors. The other interesting thing that our Bloomberg Deals colleagues note is this muted investor demand for this IPO is also starting to mute investor demand for other IPOs that are starting to get pulled as well. Again, let's see how the day shakes up. Either they draw in more people trying to buy the dip. This 38 uh, price that this opened at is still well below where it was trading in private markets recently, though much higher than its last valuation. Dave, there's a larger question here, and that is how much does this speak to perhaps diminishing demand and diminishing froth uh, that previously was a feature of this market? Dave, do you view what we're seeing right now with the Robinhood IPO as being symbolic of a bit of a cooling down in some of the hottest sectors in equities? It may well be a part of that. I mean, you can argue, and, and some analysts do, that stocks really peaked in February, depending on which indicators you're looking at. You wouldn't get that sense from the S&P 500, the way it's been setting records. But if you look, you know, certain segments of the market, uh, not just IPOs, but those special purpose acquisition companies, SPACs, uh, you know, other uh, smaller uh, companies, the Russell 2000 Index, for example. I mean, there are a lot of uh, signs that, uh, you know, stocks are uh, getting a little expensive here in the eyes of investors. And, and certainly Robinhood shares, uh, they, they've been swinging between gains and losses. They're actually below the $38 price as we speak. So it's clear that even uh, that, that IPO is looking expensive to some folks here. Dave, I wonder about the regulatory side of this. Robinhood was, of course, taking a lot of criticism months ago about encouraging people essentially to gamble, creating a, the gamification of stock trading or investing. We even saw the Secretary of State in Massachusetts sue for them to start changing the way they behaved. Does being a publicly traded company make them more or less vulnerable to that kind of criticism? 
Well, it makes them more vulnerable in the sense that you, you have uh, public shareholders deciding day in and day out whether to own the stock. And, and dealing with the regulatory issues is certainly going to be one piece of the, uh, the case as to whether you do that. So, you know, if things do kind of ramp up for Robinhood, I mean, you, you have to wonder whether this $38 price is going to look high a few months down the road. Meanwhile, we did have an interview with Robin Hood's chief executive officer, and by we, I mean our own Emily Chang of Bloomberg Television, who has uh, come in to join us now, uh, of course, host of Bloomberg Tech. And Emily, I'm curious about what he said, what Vlad Tenev said about the disappointing demand for Robin Hood shares. Was he disappointed, and what did he attribute this to? So look, Lisa, this has been a long journey for Robin Hood, for Vlad Tenev, especially the last six months, high highs, hard lows. I think when you ask any CEO on opening day if they're disappointed, they're not going to say they are. He, he called the moment surreal. And I just want to put this retail allocation into context. Yes, they said they would allocate 20 to 35 percent of shares for Robin Hood's own users. We're reporting that number is now somewhere between 20 and 25 percent. As Shanali mentioned, I did ask him how they got to that number, and I didn't give a straight answer. Yes, it's on the lower end of the range, but it is still by far uh, one of the biggest allocations for a company's own customers in history, I mean, normally the number is closer to 1% or 2%. Uh, and it does speak to this idea that they wanted to shake up this IPO process, the traditional IPO process, just like they've tried to shake up investing in general. And so I think when you look at it in, in context, it was definitely a radical move, and it certainly comes with significant risk as well, uh, potentially more volatility. Uh, some of these customers potentially flipping the shares. Uh, Robinhood does have a standard disclaimer uh, on the app that says you have to hold the shares for 30 days. Uh, of course, uh, you know, who, how do we hold in individual investors? How do they hold individual investors to this? They've warned that investors could be banned if they decide to dump the stock immediately. Uh, but if you're looking at institutions, you know, in most of those cases, you have institutional investors promising that they will hold the stock for a long period of time. And that's what Robin Hood and Vlad Tenev told me today uh, he's actually hoping for. I'm watching this uh, stock price move before our eyes here, Emily. I wonder, what is the analyst community saying about Robin Hood and what does the company plan to do with the proceeds? You know, it, it, analysts are very mixed here. Investors, individuals, people on social media are mixed. I mean, anytime I, I tweet that Vlad Tenev is coming on the show, my you know replies are filled um, with people who don't like Robin Hood, who feel still angry about what happened back in January when they halted the buying of GameStop and other shares. And so, you know, there's a lot of strong opinions out there about what Robin Hood is, what Robin Hood pretends to be or promises to be, uh, I'm actually getting uh, word that we actually do have a clip now from that interview with Vlad earlier. I want to toss to that so you can get a quick listen to what he had to say. We certainly are proud to have one of the largest retail allocations ever. And um, the way that we think about it is it's a long-term focused company and we're making decisions and making big bets uh, with the long-term interest of the business in mind. So that in response to the retail allocation question, why was it on the lower end of the range, 20 to 25 percent? Of course, he's hoping that investors are thinking about this long term. And, and we'll have to see. Yes, this is a muted debut. Pricing on the low end of the range. Opening uh, on the low end of the range. We're not seeing that pop that you want to see. Not too big, not too small uh, on the opening day of trading and there's no question that this was going to be a unique uh, company from the very start. It is not going to follow the, the pattern of some of the IPOs we have seen and like Shanali mentioned, I mean, you know, possibly is this the beginning of a more muted market in general? We don't know. Right. Let's bring Shanali back in. She's been standing by and parsing through all of the details. There's also a question about the reopening trade and this question of all these people who had stimulus checks and nothing better to do sitting on their couches and opening trading accounts. That was kind of the story for a long time. Yeah. Uh, and now there's a question of how persistent that will be, how much growth will continue to accelerate at the same pace once people can go out and spend their money on vacations rather than buying AMC. What's your sense of that? Well, first of all, look at this opening price down now closer to 35 bucks after pricing at $38 a share. So uh, immediately a drop right after openings, even after pricing at the low end of the range. You've got to hope that they don't keep that drop going into the end of the day and that they price somewhere more stable, though we were 
we're guided to expect a lot of volatility given such a high retail allocation. Again, given such a high retail allocation, if the stock drops, then you have to reassess whether or not this is the very opposite of the vindication of this model of democratizing the IPO process, which is one of the processes most beholden to institutional investors versus those retail investors. So that stock drop is significant. There's also the first buy rating on the stock. So to answer that question about the divergence of viewpoints here, you have Atlantic Equities coming in with a $65 a share price target that is uh, getting close to double where you see the stock price trading right now. Uh, again, you can talk about valuation all day long. The people that got in very, very early, Ribbit, NEA, uh, others, Index, right? You, you see them still locking in major, major gains here. Though, let's look at last year. Again, this company was valued at $11.7 billion last year. It was trading above $50 a share most recently in private markets, now down to $35 a share. So again, you have to wonder how the retail investors will stay with the stock. One other thing on that point that Lisa was making on the retail investors with those stimulus checks, over on Saturday when they were doing their virtual roadshow, investors were also asking them, retail investors were asking them about the crypto trading opportunity and how to really start looking at them vis-a-vis -vis Coinbase. Another big uh, listing this year where we've seen a lot of volatility in the stock trading a lot lower than its highs. So does Robinhood go by the way of Coinbase into the following weeks on top of today? Or do they start to compete beyond trading of regular stocks into more categories. Dave, just to follow on that, now that we know that not everybody's sitting around spending their stimmy checks on stocks, does that mean that some of these retail bros, for lack of a better term, go back to sports gambling where they came from here? And is there institutional interest in Robinhood if the retail's not there? It's such a great question because the problem with stocks like Robinhood and other stocks that raise a lot of money, especially from institutional investors so early on, is that the bankers have tapped out those institutions way before the IPO. And now you're seeing big hedge funds like Dan Sundime's D1 Capital get into uh, Robinhood before the IPO, right? They invested last year in the private rounds when really the, the gains are still to be seen in an event like this. So there's a question on whether these companies are still going public too richly valued, too late. Is Robin Hood the signaling of the end of the party after a record IPO market in the first half of the year? They had made it up to more than 18 million net funded accounts, right? That was this enormous growth up till now. But has the growth for Robin Hood in terms of both users that are joining, many of them first time users, plateauing? There are more entrants entering the market. Folks like A-Rod even backing new ventures that are looking to attract the same market. Yeah. And to your point, sports betting, more money, drawing into that market, realizing that live sports is coming back in a bigger way. Just to update everyone who's just joining now on what we're talking about, Robinhood uh, did have its debut on the NASDAQ after pricing at its lowest target of $38. Now its shares are about 3% lower, 3.5% lower uh, as people reconsider what the worth is. And Emily Chang uh, of Bloomberg Tech, the anchor there, really looking at the fundamentals with the chief executive officer of this company earlier in the day. And I'm curious from your perspective, the growth opportunities that he talked about, how uh, Vlad Tenev pushed back on people who said, you're going public too late, as Shanali was saying. And frankly, you're pricing in too much opportunity at a time of com competition. And frankly, other things to do with your money. Well, and Lisa, I've also heard the flip side. I mean, some investors were asking, why now? Why not wait some of this more negative sentiment out? They just announced two new regulatory examinations this week. And so uh, regulators are, are looking at this company, perhaps that's weighing on investors, payment for order flow, for example, which made up 81% of the company's revenue in the first quarter. Uh, you know, that's being scrutinized by the SEC. Gary Gensler said he's taking a look at that. Of course, historically, we know that payment for order flow has been scrutinized over the years. Uh, the answer uh, has always ended up you know, allowing that practice to continue. But there are a number of risk factors here. The reliance on Dogecoin, for example, which Robinhood in its own risk factor said makes up a significant amount of transactions. But I do think that sometimes the talk about Robinhood veers into what it symbolizes versus what it actually is. And if you look at the fundamentals, users doubled, monthly active users doubled year over year, 18 million 
Monthly active users, that number 8.6 million just a year ago. So even in the midst of the GameStop mania, even in the midst of all the controversy, users were still flocking to the site. I mean, I think for some of these users who might, um, you know, have negative sentiment about Robinhood, it's kind of an app that they, uh, they have a love-hate relationship with this product because it is so simple and so easy to use. And when you look at the revenue, they're bringing in almost a billion dollars, almost a billion dollars in 2020, far and away what they did in 2019. And so, you know, this is something that investors are going to have to think about. You're seeing user growth, you're seeing revenue growth, and certainly for the early investors, yes, I know this is a more muted debut, shares trading now at uh, almost $35 a piece. A company like Index, which put in $500,000 in seed money, they're walking away with three billion dollars. Uh, that is just an insane multiple. Emily, quickly, what does that regulatory sentiment possibly mean for the business model? Did Vlad speak to changing behaviors, changing the interface, maybe the way they appeal to customers, or are they sticking so by this? Vlad, over the last several months, has been talking about how they have been making these changes already, how they are a safety first company, but that that's going to be really important to them going forward. They've added, you know, hundreds of customer support people so that when there are issues, when there are technical issues, people are there to respond to that. On the regulatory point, just to elucidate the two new regulatory examinations that the company disclosed this week, one is that the SEC and FINRA are looking into employee trades of meme stocks like GameStop and AMC back in January when uh, all of that uh, controversy went down. The other is that uh, Baiju Bhatt, the co-founder of Robinhood, along with Vlad Tenev, aren't actually registered with FINRA. So, uh, you know, Vlad did respond to those today. He said they're working with regulators. They want to be transparent, but truly there are, are a lot of unknowns and they don't necessarily, uh, you know, they can't control what regulators decide to do. They right. can work with regulators, which they've said over and over again they are doing, but, you know, who knows where regulation is going to end up. Just to bring you the latest, Robinhood shares are now down about 10% after opening at $38 a share, currently uh, around $34.29. Dave Wilson still here on standby. And I've got to say, Dave, one reason why it's always fabulous to talk with you is you can broaden out and put this into perspective of IPOs. We have gotten a record slew of IPO volume, and we saw that pop kind of diminish gradually. Is this becoming the new normal? Yes, this is an idiosyncratic story, but has there been more skepticism about companies that are going public perhaps too late as one criticism is or perhaps looking at opportunities that will not persist past the pandemic well you certainly have to raise that question i mean bear in mind that what we're seeing with robin hood today comes on the heels of what we've seen over the past month with china's dd global the ride hailing service they go public and then in essence Chinese regulators change the game and the shares, well, the American depository receipts, they fall as much as 49% from their IPO price. Now, they're up today after the Wall Street Journal reported on the possibility that the company would go private again. But, you know, these are the sort of issues that, you know, you get too many of them and you can understand why people would be perhaps less inclined to invest in these newly public companies. Dave, could that mean good things for other stocks? We all know when there's a hot IPO market, that tends to draw money sometimes out of established names. If we're starting to cool off on IPOs, what does that mean for other big tech companies, other growth stocks that people might be looking at? Well, when you take a step back, you can think of the IPO market as sort of a barometer of risk to the extent that people are not willing, perhaps, to take as much risk in these newly public companies, they may not be willing to take as much risk in other areas of the market as well. You know, when you talk about big tech, look at what's going on with Facebook shares today. They're down because, you know, the company's figuring that their growth rate is going to slow in the second half. They're not going to get the pop that they had in the latest quarter from advertisers trying to get back in people's sites after the pandemic uh, sort of cooled off. So, you know, these are the sorts of issues going forward. Uh, you, you have to kind of put the IPO market 
in the bigger context of, you know, just how willing are investors to take risk now? Shanali, I'd love you to weigh in on this. Shanali Basik, who's been tracking the price action here and talking about potentially the retail participation. I know you did a special on that. You've been tracking that uh, closely. What are you hearing in terms of other IPOs? Has there been a rethink of perhaps waiting longer? Uh, as Emily was saying, that there was getting some pushback from people saying perhaps this wasn't the right time and you should have waited for a period that seemed a little bit more, I don't know, effervescent. Yeah, it's interesting to ask that question because there's this expectation that bankers have this worry that after Labor Day that the market can get much choppier. So the other part of this argument is that going now is better, less volatility. But to Emily's point, for Robinhood specifically, there are plenty of reasons with these regulatory issues that right now could have felt like a choppy time. Again, this volatility we're seeing may be more of a dynamic of the listing itself. Huge retail allocation, but also the fact that as employees can sell on day one, right? So you have the selling pressure, and now do you have bankers and underwriters that are picking up the buying pressure in the open market? There's a fun fact here, Lisa. This listing on the NASDAQ, we are interviewing the president, Nelson Griggs, a little bit later, is very interesting because the technology works a little differently. If Robinhood had gone public on the New York Stock Exchange, for example, it likely would have had a designated market maker. For many IPOs, that's Citadel Securities. So in doing this with NASDAQ, they don't have that intermediary, but they have a different set of technology that you you have to imagine NASDAQ and Robinhood sitting there, seeing who's buying, seeing who's selling, and seeing what's behind this volatility to make sure that we end the day much smoother, right? You never want to see a 10% decline right out of the gate. Uh, when we look back at this later today and into tomorrow, we're going to be asking ourselves, again, how much of this is selling pressure from existing employees? Uh, where were the buyers? Why was retail investment so low when they had up to 35% of their allocation uh, potentially allowed for retail investors. One answer that Bloomberg Intelligence gives us is there's a penalty for flipping shares. You can't sell right away. Or you can sell, but there's a penalty that you face in not getting into other types of IPOs through IP, uh, Robinhood's IPO access product. There's a lot of reasons that this is interesting, not just for Robinhood, but others who are trying to make these IPOs more available for retail investors. Yes, that is uh, the new fintechs like Robinhood, like SoFi, but it is also the biggest banks like Morgan Stanley, which has E-Trade, that is watching this kind of thing very, very closely and seeing how this process can be democratized. Uh, yeah. No matter how today goes, it is um, an experiment worth watching. Indeed. Shanali Basik, thank you so much. Also, our thanks to Bloomberg's Dave Wilson and, of course, Emily Chang, who had that terrific interview with Vlad Tenev, the chief executive officer of Robinhood, earlier today. Meanwhile, we are dealing with a slew of earnings that have been coming out, and they have highlighted the strength in the economy, the strength in the consumer. They also have highlighted an issue that company after company has dealt with, and that is higher costs of inputs, as well as, of course, uh, supply chain kinks and labor shortages. For more, let's bring in Dave Gitlin. He's Carrier Chairman and Chief Executive Officer, dealing with HVAC equipment and all things uh, having to do with our air, which is also very important, and we will get to that in a second. But let's just start, Dave, with a sense of the input costs and how much they have been increasing. We were hearing from Senator Scott about inflationary worries. How significantly is this impact your bottom line and your business plans. It's acute, but we're managing it. You know, you look at, we came into the year thinking our sales would be up about 5%. It's going to be up more than 11% over last year. And if you look at the second quarter, we just announced sales up 30%. We were up 7% over the same quarter of 2019. So much more sales than we anticipated. What that really means is that we're going to have two and a half million more manufacturing hours than we had anticipated. What that means is 2,000 more employees on our shop floor that we need to go hire. So there's acute challenges to go hire people. Inflation has been significant on raw materials. For us, that means copper, steel, aluminum. So we were very well hedged coming into the year, but now we're buying in the spot market. Copper last year, $2.50 a pound. Now it's $4.50 a pound. We're, we're having to buy in the spot market because of our hedge position. So we are, we are seeing inflationary pressures. But I'll tell you, we're managing it. And what's nice is that the top line's growing and it's dropping through at a good margin. As you deal with those pressures, Dave, I wonder if you're dealing as well with the chip shortage with a lot of the products that you make. We've seen everything from cars to refrigerators slow down production because of it. What does it mean for your company? We are. We're seeing chip shortages. The biggest supply chain challenges we have today are around chips, steel, aluminum, some resin, and then second tier suppliers. 
But the reality is that we tried to get out in front by stocking a lot of inventory. So we were very pleased because we, we saw some of the growth coming as we got into 4Q. We looked at our highest risk components, including many of the chips. So we actually pre-stocked many of the buffer material we needed on chips, and we've been managing that quite well. Dave, you talked about labor shortages. And you said 2,000 employees. Yes. Everywhere I look, when I walk down the street, there are signs saying we're looking to hire people in New York City and elsewhere. And I'm wondering from your perspective, what's the main obstacle as you try to hire 2,000 people with technical skill? Competition. You know, we, we need more highly skilled labor. And what you're seeing is a lot of competition for that highly skilled labor. So take our Tennessee factory, for example. We have, we have wanted to hire three to 500 people there for months. And we're competing with Amazon, we're competing with FedEx. And you are looking, there's a shortage of highly skilled talent for the amount of demand there is for that skill. So, you know, look, we need to keep, we need to keep at it, but the, the labor shortage issue we have is primarily in the United States. 80% of our people are outside the United States, and we're, we're generally managing the labor challenge outside the U.S. well. It's really a U.S.-centric issue, but the team is on top of it. Are you raising salaries? We're, ra we're having to raise uh, compensation, including in some of our factories, and, and we're also raising prices. Uh, clearly, the inflationary pressure is we can't get caught in the middle. So we are now on our third price increase pretty much across our portfolio just this year. It's not only to help us in the third and fourth quarter of this year, but we're really focused on managing next year as well. Dave, every company and every CEO is dealing with their own version of COVID with the Delta variant spreading and resurgence in a lot of different areas of the country. You have to go into homes and businesses in many cases to do your work. And I wonder, to that extent, how you're dealing with your own workers with regard to masking and vaccinations. We've strongly encouraged everyone to get the vaccine. We haven't mandated it. But what we have said is that if you've been vaccinated, you don't need to wear masks. So that has been another incentive, especially for factory workers that are out on the factory floor wearing a mask all day is not ideal. And it's the same for our office workers. So we have said that you don't need to wear a mask indoors if you've been vaccinated. We've also made we've given people time off to get the vaccination in many of our sites. We've actually administered the vaccine as well. So we're strongly, strongly encouraging it just short of mandating. Have you found your products with HVAC and air filtration to be more in demand because of COVID? Or is it too hard to tell with such a high level of demand from the housing market, for instance, and the reopening of corporate America? It's absolutely been driven in part by COVID, but we also think that the demand we're seeing for our products is here to stay because there is this broad interest in healthy indoor environments. What COVID has done is shined a light on the criticality of safe indoor environments. People spend 90% of their time indoors, and now people are starting to think about air like they think about safe drinking water. So when you go into a crowded indoor environment, you can now, people are going to want to know, do I have safe, is it protective against COVID or the flu or colds or things like other airborne spread diseases. So there's a lot more demand for people wanting to be safe in indoor environments, and that's exactly what we do. How long do you think that this incredible demand is going to continue? You said that you think it's going to be a permanent feature, but it can only uh, be a permanent feature for as long as people have money. Where are we in the business cycle? We, we think that some of the secular trends that are driving our growth are here to stay. Sustainability is absolutely a mega trend that will continue to uh, exist for decades to come. 40% of carbon emissions come from buildings. And 40% of that comes from HVAC systems. So we are very well positioned to be part of the solution when it comes to sustainability. Healthy indoor air environments, before people make a restaurant reservation in the future, before you come back into crowded commercial office buildings, people are going to want to see, do I have a safe indoor environment? Are my, do I have elevated particular matter levels? Or do I have a risk of more COVID spread. It, you know, we have shown that with better filtration and ventilation, you can reduce the spread of COVID by 80%. So there's gonna be a trend that's actually here to stay on both healthy and sustainable indoor environments. Thanks to Carrier Global CEO, Dave Gitlin, speaking with us today on Balance of Power on Bloomberg Radio and TV. The bipartisan infrastructure plan advanced by the Senate last night promises to create thousands of jobs to help fix America's roads and bridges, install broadband, replace lead pipes, many other projects that are outlined. But will there be enough workers to fill all those positions? Joining us to talk about it, Richard Trumka, president of the AFL-CIO. Welcome back to Balance of Power. Thanks, Joe. Thanks for having me on. <clears throat> I spoke about this yesterday uh, with the Labor Secretary, Marty Walsh. With regard to getting back to work, do you believe that we'll actually have enough 
people to fill these positions? We're talking about thousands of bridges, roads, and tunnels. Absolutely. Uh, we still have 13.2 million people right now, Joe, that are drawing unemployment benefits. That means there's 13.2 million that aren't working. Our apprenticeship programs are at full blast. We're able to put out skilled people. We can provide the skilled labor necessary. They're going to have to pay them a fair wage to be able to get them. Uh, but when we do that, we'll have the skilled people and the number of people to get the job done. You'll have to pay a, fair, uh, pay a fair wage, but also potentially train them. Some of this work is high tech that we're looking at when we talk about broadband, when we talk about some of the other projects outlined in the infrastructure framework. And I realize some of this could change, but how important will training be for the workers who have been, in many cases, at home for months? Oh, exceptional. And, and you know, the labor movement's known that for years. That's why we have the best uh, advanced, most advanced training programs or apprenticeship programs. Uh, in the world. The best kept secret, Joe, is that other than the military, the union uh, movement trains more people every year than anybody else. And we retrain our people. So we understand that reskilling them and upgrading their skills is an absolutely essential part of what we do. So we bring our people back in every couple of years. We retrain them with the most modern methods and most skills. And if we see the industry taking a turn, uh, away from where we are to another direction, we train them for that. Example, uh, our IBW brothers and sisters, uh, they train not only electricians, they're now training uh, for, for uh, photosynthesis and, and solar panels and solar cells and solar energy and wind energy. They're training and giving their skills to be able to work in that industry because yeah. that's the direction we see things going. Richard, uh, certainly there's a monetary impulse there, too, with fiscal plans, the infrastructure spending plan of $550 billion, at least in the bipartisan uh, basis, that seems to be coming together. What's your sense? Do you approve of this plan? Well, look, we're, we're really encouraged uh, by uh, the bipartisan infrastructure plan that's been reached after all the delay and all of the decline in our infrastructure. We're still reviewing the details of the agreement, but I, I have to tell you, uh, it is absolutely essential that we invest in roads and bridges and transit and rail and climate change mitigation and electric vehicles and so many more things, including broadband, uh, that are out there. But it's also essential that we pr the infrastructure spending includes the strongest possible protection for labor standards, because what cannot happen is federal spending can't be used to drive down the wages of workers that are out there or pay them less than, than the prevailing wage in that area. So we want to make sure that's there. And when that happens, the combination of those th two things will create good jobs. Those good jobs will create spending. The spending creates demand. The demand creates more jobs. Thanks to AFL-CIO President Richard Trumka for talking with us today on Bloomberg Radio and Television. Yeah, Joe, it's just been a fascinating moment in time where you do see, uh, start to see the seeds of a shift from the power from employers to potentially employees with people being able to demand higher wages. I mean, the fact that the carrier chief executive officer said that they are increasing wages across the board and able to pass along those price increases is a, a real shift. But how long will it last? And that's what the Fed's been uh, really debating. How long will it last? And I have to admit, Lisa, I'm still wondering how many of these jobs are shovel ready and ready to start working on now. We'll find out in the next couple of months. Yeah, good point. We've got more coming up on Sound On with Joe Matthew. You're going to be joining us. This is Bloomberg. Bloomberg.